good evening everybody and you're all very welcome to this which is the seventh in our series of Let's Talk Equine. This webinar I must remind is being recorded and will be made available on www.chats.ie. Your questions can be submitted via the Q&A button which you should find at the bottom of your screen and these uh, will be addressed at the end of the discussion. So I'm delighted to um, to have with me here this evening, uh, John Hoy in Carrickview Stud in County Armagh. John, thank you so much thank for taking the time out to be with us here this evening. I'm very grateful for that. Thank you. Hey. Grateful for the opportunity. Thank you. You're very welcome. Um, I suppose, look, you know, to start, you have a reputation as a very respected veterinary surgeon. Um, you are very accomplished in the area of reproductive. You, um, you know, uh, you, you specialised, I suppose, in the reproductive side of things in terms of yes. eye and embryo transfer, and you know, your broaching care of ICSI and so forth. So this is something I guess that you have devoted a lot of time into gaining the experience, the experience in, which is also very important. Yes, certainly. Yeah. 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 And you know, to top that off. My impression certainly is that you are exceptionally passionate also about breeding. Very much so, yeah, yeah, definitely, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that is that two things go hand in hand. Yeah, and that certainly seems to be something that, that uh, motivates you. What, you know, as a breeder, what would you say is really your, your ambition or your goal as a breeder? I suppose like everyone else, um, you know, we ultimately aim to breed the best we can breed. And I suppose I focus mainly on show jumping and to some extent eventing. So certainly would love to breed a 160 horse and a four, five star eventer. But um, I think first and foremost, um, I want to breed sound, rideable horses that there's a market for and ultimately have a job and a purpose. That's mm -hmm. first and foremost. And hopefully along the way we will hit, hit the big time. <laughs> But, you know, like everyone else, we're all chasing the dream. Chasing the dream and trying to be commercial, I suppose, at the same yeah, time, and keep, keep, keep them moving as well. Yeah. Yeah, I think commercial, sorry to interrupt, I think commercial, being commercial is one of the most important fa factors with us as well. You know, we want to breed nice horses, but we also want to breed commercial because it has to pay its way and try and um, keep the ball rolling, as it were. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, not an easy task sometimes. No, definitely not. Definitely yeah. not. Um, where, where did your interest begin? Where did your interest stem from? Um, I grew up on a farm, so um, we always was heavily involved with farming. Um, my dad had sucked our cow herd, so I've always been involved sort of outdoors. We always had a mare, um, mostly an Irish draft, and she was crossed either to the Irish draft or to the thoroughbred. Mm -hmm. And I suppose as a time progressed on the farm I focused more sort of on the horse side of things as opposed to the cattle and that's where my passion lay and um, tried to educate myself as to try and make it viable as my dad's a farmer he was always you know the business it has to pay so I suppose I tried to always look at the if it could make it as a viable business and ultimately sort of tried to educate myself as to how to do that I wouldn't say I'm from a horse breeding background but certainly breeding animals and heavily involved in, in, in that has always been a part of my life. Mm -hmm. Okay and um, I suppose you know um, in terms of kind of you know what you're at you 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 have you have a brood my band of 12 mares I gather. And yeah tw 12 to 15 I actually don't count sometimes because it scares me <laughs> at this time of year so just sometimes <laughs> go with the number and roll with it I, yeah something in that ballpark figure. <laughs> I reckon you're not alone in that. Uh, <laughs> and um, some of these mares are mares you own outright, and then other mares are mares that you have in partnership with. Yeah, them. yeah. I'm only actually there's um, there's Al, uh, Alan Robertson from Robertson Equine, and um, we own two mares with him. Aside mm -hmm. from that, I have no real connections with anyone else. Alan's been a long-standing okay. client and friend, and it made sense mm -hmm. sometimes to be able to open up doors to buy better mares is to mm -hmm. go in partnership with someone. So. Mm -hmm. uh, at the moment, it's only Alan we own Mares with, but yeah, okay. two Mares with Alan. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And we'll come back to look at one of those before we, we finish this discussion today. Um, just, I'm going to actually just try and start to share, the, share my, my screen here. Okay. I'm getting set up with that. Um, maybe just ask you to comment also, you know, we're going to look at a selection of, of six of your Mares, hopefully that we have time to go through those. Um, okay. And, you know, the Mares that you've identified, um, they are a selection of somewhat older mares um, yes. 
And, you know, I suppose it's important at the outset maybe to acknowledge that you have a skill set that is unique as a breeder mm -hmm. and that allows you, I suppose, you know, in a financial sense as well to manage some of these older and maybe more challenging mares. And if perhaps, you know, uh, another breeder were to take on some of these, they might find themselves in, in you know, in a road of somewhat more expenses, expenses, you know, to try. Absolutely. Absolutely. You might just, while I'm, while I'm um, getting set up here, just, just maybe comment on that if you would. Um, yeah, I think that's an important thing to bring um, to the, the fore because ultimately with being a vet, we're able to um, exploit our skill set and ultimately we can buy the mare that's difficult to get in foal that maybe has a checkered reproductive history and that sometimes allows us to get a better mare um, that someone else, you know, for, for better price and, and whatnot and sort of the commercial viability for a breeder who is not a vet who's having to pay for all these services, ultimately that could end up being very expensive. So that's something we try to exploit and we certainly aren't afraid to buy a mare with a checkered reproductive past as long as we got a good clear history and we feel there potentially is something we can work on or something we can do to sort of enhance that mare's fertility and like everything else sometimes it doesn't work sometimes it does and hopefully mm -hmm. when it does it, it pays dividends so that's definitely something we're, we're, we're on for. Okay so um, can you see my screen now yourself at the moment? I can yeah yeah I can Brilliant. yeah. Brilliant. That's a good start. So we're, we're going to kick off with this, this mare here, um, CC Cat. She's a 16-year-old mare by Casal Allen out of a Coronado Cassini mother. Um, look, you know, to start with, I suppose, when we see her here physically, um, you know, it'll be obvious enough to people that, you know, she, she has, has evolved to be weak through her, her back. Yeah. Yeah. Um, age related quite possibly. Yeah. Um, you know, what attracted you? How did you get into this marriage and what attracted oh, so, you? So so that's a very good to point out. So the dippy back, as you sort of allude to there, um uh, was something that she's always had, mm -hmm. even from a young horse. But I think, um, like everything else with every mare that we select for a breeding programme, everything has to be on a balance. So I think I took a, a gamble on the basis of she had a very good pedigree. She had very good performance as a young mm -hmm. horse. She showed a lot of potential. And certainly um, as she went on up the ranks, seemed mm -hmm. to be able to go on to fulfil that potential. Unfortunately, an injury cut short quite a promising career. And I think on the balance of everything, we thought she was worth the gamble um, to, to add to our breeding program. Mm -hmm. And coincidentally, she's produced us uh, two foals, three foals now, sorry. And none, none of them have had a week back or, and we've been very careful with stallion selection to select a stallion with a good strong back mm -hmm. and um, good front feet because being typically Holstein, she would have upright boxy feet. And mm -hmm. I suppose we're quite, uh, when we select a stallion, we go for a big powerhouse horse. And mm -hmm. um, she came and foaled to a son of Canaan. And since then, we bred her to Vigor Dur Sule mm -hmm. and to Louis Dam. So big powerhouse horses, which we mm -hmm. felt complimented her. And mm -hmm. ultimately, we tried to improve where she lacked. And that was our plan. And so this mare, she actually was third in the five-year-old final in the Sunshine Tour in, in Spain in 2009. Um, yes. And she competed also in the RDS as a seven-year-old. Is that right? Yes, 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 yes. And she looked, she was, I think in her latter years, she was being campaigned by PJ Buka. So ultimately she was ridden by a, a, a rider recognised at international level. And I think they had very high hopes for her. And I contacted him when I was going to buy the mare and he had nothing but good things to say. So I think it's important to get a rider's perspective on it as well. And um, from a breeder's point of view, you want to hear what the rider has to say, because if you need to improve on anything, you're very aware, aware of that when you're doing your sire selection, or if you need to sort of be careful of certain things or attributes which were not desirable with the mare to sort of correct those and uh, try your best to minimise the chance of those breeding. Yeah, I, I think that's an exceptionally valid point, John. I'm not sure now at your end, I'm seeing this video, the videos are playing a little bit delayed at my end. I can't, I can't see any. <laughs> you can't see any no, videos no, at all. No, I'm just getting a, bla a black screen. Oh, yeah. sorry about that. Okay. Um, all right. Well, some of the other ones will show that they're bedded in. Apologies about that. that that's, um, that that's just a, a dysfunction on the, on the um, technical side of things here. 
Okay, well, you've made some very, very valid points on that. Um, this is the, the mayor's um, mayor line. So, you know, again, well related to other others, meter 45, meter 40 horses, um, you know, there's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a good standing in behind her there in that sense as well. I think the important thing to highlight here is not necessarily that it is 160, 160 and I suppose the black type that everyone has become so obsessed with nowadays. Mm -hmm. But I think the important thing for me is that it's performance. So yeah. there is a demonstration that in the dam line there is athleticism consistently through each dam line. And where it might not be 160 and considered black type, I think everything has to be based on a balance. So in terms of the mare's own performance, her type and her pedigree, I think it all has to be looked at together and mm -hmm. we it's important we don't get too fix, fixated on pages and black type i think it's something we can easily get well led by and sometimes sacrifice yeah. type and stuff on the basis yeah. of paperwork so i think that's something i really want to stay clear of as much yeah. as possible yeah i agree with you john um and just here um we've 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 photographic evidence of of previous progeny here the yeah um, you mentioned these already, but you know it's very easy to see even just from the photograph here. You know the form yeah. with both these individuals, and in particular with the the Vigo Darsui here. Yeah, but she that's literally from last week, and it's her first time at loose jumping, and she's brought in as a two year old just to see. Um, you know, does she de demonstrate athleticism? And if you notice on this filly actually in particular, you know she's quite strong through the back. So mm -hmm. when we've actually corrected that with the stallion choice, we feel mm -hmm. it's really worked. And we feel that this filly, in our opinion, demonstrates athleticism, is nice over the fence, looks mm -hmm. nice, she's got a good temperament. So it's actually a filly we're quite excited about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and you, you, you're you right. Lee. So you, you covered um, this mare with Louis Dam, as you said. Yes. And um, we'll just move on to the video here and hoping that, is this thing okay for you at your end? Yeah, I can see this, yeah. yeah. Right, okay. So you might talk to us about this um this filly here, John. Okay, so this filly is by Louis Dam. We felt that CC Catch had the blood to handle Louis Dam, and obviously any Irish breeder will respect Louis Dam as a sire. He's been a phenomenal sire for the Irish um breeders. And again, this filly to me demonstrates athleticism. She's strong to her back, she's a lot of presence, and she's a good athletic filly, and that's ultimately what we're trying to um aim to breed. And to me, she has everything i really really like this filly and um, mm -hmm. she's gone to a wonderful home a young uh, young rider has bought her and um, quite an exciting talent and it'll be interesting to see her progression because like every breeder knows um production is a massive part of mm -hmm. how the horses we breed go on to represent our, our us as breeders mm -hmm. and a lot of horses unfortunately are lost on poor production or don't ever get the chance to mm -hmm. show talents that they may have so it's important for us that when we're selling horses as well it's not just a case of who has the biggest pockets it's also thinking about the long game and thinking mm -hmm. about who can um showcase the horse yep. the best so that's Ab important too absolutely so you chose emerald then for the next cross for this year um hoping for for um progeny by emerald for next year yeah yeah we've always been a fan of emerald even from the early days and um yeah consistently i think emerald has demonstrated that he is going to be a very respected sire um, coincidentally we actually recently along with alan and robert snackwine acquired an embryo uh, by camille foe from the full sister of emerald and what attracts me to emerald is the consistency in the dam line and um, his dam is produced a number of good horses and then going on down two and three generations you can see that performance is consistent and this is at a phenomenal high level it's the 160 yeah. so it's proper black type and for us yeah. it's very very important and yeah. we've invested in the emerald lane again because we think it's going to, yeah. going to become one of the europe's top lanes so very yeah. excited and i like the fact that the french host time cross i think is a is a good cross and when you've got diamant and casal cathargo also in the damn lane of emerald big powerhouse horses to complement cc catch for that holstein holstein mm -hmm. lane and the holstein type Mm -hmm. Well, hopefully it goes well for you now. Thank God. Yeah, so um, we're going to move on now to another mayor of yours. And this lady now is, um, she's 21 years of age. Yes. Yeah. Um, I will attempt to play the video, um, John. Let me know at your end if it is working or not. We may have to ask people to look it up themselves yeah. by YouTube if it's not showing. 
see a black screen or do you see the... I'm not seeing anything. No, You're not black seeing screen. anything. Black yeah. screen. Okay. Well, that tells me that possibly our viewers are seeing the very same. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> Hold on now one sec, we'll get rid of that. This is the joys of, of uh, technology. Yeah. Can you still see my she my screen? I can. I can't see the presentation. It's gone. It's one sec now. Hold on. We get ourselves going again. Okay. So we're yeah. back. So yeah. now you should see you should see here the pedigree of Pastor Eldest Mesh. All right. Um, can people can find her if they if they just basically Google that and and uh, put it into YouTube. They'll, they'll and the, vi the video is actually of her in her latter years. I think it's when she's 18, going around yeah. to 120 with a young rider. But yeah, I think from it. that, you can, you can see enough that, you know, she's a good jumper and um, looks rideable and looks to have all the attributes of, a, of, of an athletic mare. Um, and to meter, five, meter 45 as a... Yes, yes. So um, this is this is the, the pedigree here. Um, I actually will be able to show via hope. Hmm, I'm not sure actually the other video probably won't work now tonight. Um, or this, I'm afraid, um, given they're, they're, not, they're not moving across from YouTube at the moment. Is that, is that music coming at your end or my end now, John? It's not my end now, you know, we're in silent here. Bear with me now for a second. Um, something is. Something is playing here from one of these. Pardon me, John. One second. Okay. okay. So we should be back into the presentation. You might just talk to us a little bit. You, you're familiar with Cadiz de Rosier and Extraordinaire. Both of these horses have competed in 60. Um, videos are available. People can look them up. They're really very, very easy to find. Um, super performers and, you know, great to have them so close up in the dam line. Yeah, I think I think when the opportunity came up to buy this mare, um, she was old. I only bought this mare last year, um, and she had somewhat of a checkered, uh, reproductive past, as we alluded to earlier on. And but when I seen the pedigree, and when I seen it accompanied with the performance, the fact that the mare herself had jumped at what I consider a decent high level, and then the fact that she produced a uh, two. She actually produced three foals and two of them were competing at 160 level. I was quite excited and decided that, um, yeah, she would be a very valuable asset to her breeding program. Um, mm -hmm. Ubalu was the first foal she had, the first embryo, uh, born by embryo transfer last year. And we are expecting two embryos from her in 2021. This is Caddy and here is um, Karakyu Ubalu. And Karakyu Ubalu, you um, presented at auction in yes. England at the Bowlesworth um, yeah. session. You know, maybe just for a minute, if, if, if you if you don't mind, you know, I mean, obviously you sell foals at the farm gate, you 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 pitch foals at auction. Um, how difficult is it for you to arrive at, at we we'll say, reserve prices or at, at, you know, value prices in your head? How do you, how... How do you navigate that, John? Well, I think it's difficult. I think, to ask. I think that um, I don't usually go to auction. Um, the Bowlesworth sale was something different, and we decided to try it and give it a go. Certainly mm -hmm. felt it was a... Uh, um, a good auction. We're very pleased. The foal's going to a fantastic home where we hope he'll be well produced and it certainly looks like he will be. Mm -hmm. um, I think that um, in terms of pitching prices of foals, I think I have a good grasp on the value of animals. I think I mm -hmm. uh, you know, have been around enough and I have seen enough foals sold mm -hmm. that I kind of have a fair idea of a foal's value. Mm -hmm. And I think the one of the most important aspects of me as a breeder is I am realistic. Mm. Um, and I don't think all my uh, geese are swans as it were mm. so mm. I am very realistic and my primary aim of breeding is to sell us foals we want to sell us mm. foals we don't want to keep on for production we will occasionally keep a couple of fillies but um, it's yeah it's difficult to gauge but if your finger's on the pulse of the market and you're watching mm. auctions all over Europe and all over Ireland I think you can ultimately have a good grasp of what actually a foal is worth and I tend to think that I price the foals fairly um, mm -hmm. and yeah we mm -hmm. seem to be able to sell them yeah. so ultimately they're certainly not overpriced because we seem mm -hmm. to have buyers and people who consistently come back. Mm 
Mm -hmm. So you you chose Cantargas as the mating for this mayor then for 2020. Um, why so? Um, I really like Cantargas. Um, I think I go to Lanarkin every year, and um, you know I've seen some nice progeny by Cantargas. And I've seen a few here in Ireland as well, um, notably a, a seven-year-old campaign by Greg Broderick, which is the Contargos Balabed Rue Cross. I think it recently done very well in the Irish Breeders Classic. And I think I really like that cross. And um, when I look deeper into the dam line of that, it's quite similar to my own. So mm -hmm. I thought, you know, if that's worked there, this cross is looks like it's potential. It and I think mm -hmm. Susan Patrick had one as well. So Contargos is a name which I feel is keeps cropping up. Mm -hmm. And um, I've used him on, um, we actually um, acquired the full sister of Dominator Z for a client. And um, in that, we were able to uh, avail of an embryo from the mare, mm -hmm. kindly by the owners, KPCM horses, um, mm -hmm. allowed us to have an embryo. And we actually done her with Contargos as well. Mm -hmm. And we really rate Contargos and we think he's a very up and coming, exciting mm -hmm. sire for the future. Really mm -hmm. think he has mm -hmm. all the attributes to be a top class sire. And, and the joy of doing what you do, you went for number two. Um, so yes. You, you also used Tango of Anazutov as well. Yes. Um, he's a strong French influence with the Laudanum and the Fair Play and the Gemini. So we felt that um, with the Mirror's strong uh, French influence with the Balabé de Rue and the Muguet de Manoir, or however you pronounce that, my French isn't great. We felt Mine's that, not much that better. Was, <laughs> we felt that was a strong cross and um, sort of exploiting those self francais genes and mm -hmm. uh, yeah we're, we're excited and he obviously is a very good sire he's ranked highly in the wsbf rankings and mm -hmm. cons consistently widely used over ireland and i again have been lucky enough firsthand to see how he crosses mm -hmm. and um the balabed ruiz and me are built a bit uphill and strong mm -hmm. through the, the neck and the mm -hmm. tangellos they tell me come a little bit downhill speaking mm -hmm. to riders they said they're mm -hmm. very on their forehand so i thought that would complement a uh, mm -hmm. pastorel looking at our type and then we went for it so it remains mm -hmm. to be seen if it's worked but anyway mm -hmm. we, we, we went for it on that basis Mm -hmm. but i like that you that you you do sit back and try and use the logic of complementing the the physicalities of the, the the stallion and the mare as well too i think that's very important i think you know when in all our maintenance you know sometimes we get it right sometimes we get it wrong but ultimately there is a thought process that goes into it and mm -hmm. we're not following fashion we are actually keeping it commercial and following fashion to an extent but mm -hmm. we're very much aware of our marriage weak points mm -hmm. and we're trying to use stallions which obviously um, could improve those so mm -hmm. that's important for us yeah very much mm -hmm. so yeah that's that, that's that's good um this this mare here um double so 12 year old has jumped to meter 30 clinton and emo castor talk to us about her um John. Yeah, so the opportunity to come up to buy this mare, her um, history is that she's actually show jumped to 130 level and evented up to two star level. So mm -hmm. a mare that has had both hats on and I suppose that first drew me to her because again, the demonstration of athleticism was mm -hmm. prominent in the mare. The mare was a fantastic type. We um, excited also that she was a Clinton mare. We, we just, I think that Clinton is a very decent brood mare sire. And the mare had had a canon foal and then tried to return to competition after an injury. That didn't go so well. So hence now she's a full-time brood mare. Um, and yeah, she is a half-sister to Rodrigo Pessoa's Winsome O, who competed on the World Equestrian Games. Mm -hmm. So again, we thought that was quite good. And then we see that her uh, dad, the second dam here is the dam of an approved stallion by El Dorado. So again, mm -hmm. the dam line was decent. Um, mm -hmm and yeah consistently producing performance in every generation so yeah we thought that she would be a valuable asset and went for it and uh, acquired her mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and here we have a very short video of a um now four-year-old but a two-year-old um, yes this is the canon from this mirror two-year-old yeah yeah which you're happy to have i'm sure john yeah, well, I actually don't own the Canaan. That was just the people who, yeah. So basically, the Canaan is from the mirror. But yeah, we, we, uh, I think that video was quite exciting. It showed that the mirror was breeding athleticism. It's nice and light over the fence and looks a pretty decent horse. So, you know, if I had a two year old who's jumping like that, I'd be pretty happy. And um, yeah, I thought it's very, very nice. So that confirmed that the mirror was a good asset. So yeah, excited. So you used Harley with this mare? Yeah. 
I think the, the thinking behind that was that the Clinton Heartbreaker Cross seems to be um, very, very um, prominent if you look at all the, the results of the young horse classes and stuff in, in the continent. Mm -hmm. And talk to us about this horse, a smart, smart individual, John. Very smart individual. You know, from day one, he was an athlete. And as you see here, him going through the field in my fantastic video. <laughs> which um, the canines lend a hand, yeah, a hand. Everything, everything's on hand to do their job um, and Sam's running very well there um, what do you call it I think that the foal has a lot of presence he's good you know active in his hocks he's very active step and to me he looks very powerful and yeah I'd be very very pleased with that cross and um, he actually sold to Sheikh Samir Murdad um, and it'll be exciting to follow his future yeah, he looks a re really good coat to me anyway. Yeah, absolutely. And hopefully in the right hands now. So um, you you have mated this mare also with Contargus, who we've, sp we've spoken about already, probably for not too dissimilar reasons to, to the previous mare. Yeah, and then, you know, Harley is from a, a Cathargo mare, so the Cathargo thing seemed to work, and Clinton, and yeah, we sort of were very excited. So yeah, I think Cathargos on the basis, as I've said before, um, mm -hmm. looks like a really good sire. So yeah, that was the principles behind that. Mm -hmm. So this is this is actually one of the younger mares that we're looking at of the group that, that, that we're talking about. Um, pronunciations again, excuse me, but La, La Cotique uh, Van Den Dale uh, by For Passion, DVZ. Uh, Flipperdale Narcos and yes. photographs here of the mare when when she was um, in work and yeah. you know certainly she appears careful and wants to do the job. Yeah I think. Um, in the sport yourself did you know her in the sport? No I didn't know her in the sport and um, this mare actually came a friend of mine from um, Holland actually contacted me and told me about the mare and um, explained to me that the mare was injured and that she was in a stable which was primarily focused on competition and the mare was going to come up for a sale and um, obviously I watched the videos and like you said there the mare seemed to demonstrate the qualities we look for careful an athlete looked a nice type and um, loved the like the breeding like the strong self francais influence coming through in that dam line um, and she's a good model and good type as you see there yeah. And um, we like the fact her mother, she competed herself to 1 meter 35 level. Her mother competed to 140 and is a, ha a, sorry, a full sister, Tim Stockdale's tornado this month, who's a 160. Mm -hmm. And yeah, strong performance on the dam line, which we, um, we liked, yeah. So. Mm -hmm. And just, um, we have an individual here, look, you know, people again, when they, when they go back in afterwards, they can look up this animal themselves um, via YouTube. Um, we commented the other evening we were looking at it a particularly nice individual over fence and yes you weren't ashamed it was a, 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 a grand son of the mayor um, yes so, yeah and uh we'll just move forward now because i'm conscious of um you have mated this mayor um with comil foe so the mayor the mayor arrived um late august early september i can't really remember 2019 and no 20 yeah 2019 mm -hmm. and um it was late in the season so we decided that we would do an embryo with her so we could start her early in the season next year and again as you alluded to before the fact that we do what we do it's not a big deal for us to do that um so we decided that was possibly the best course of action and yeah look i've loved Camille fo as a sire from day dot i've loved him as a performer he's a horse that i really 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 love and if his season was a little bit better i would probably use it across the board but mm -hmm. as everyone knows the semen is just okay mm -hmm. and um we were lucky enough that she actually produced twins on that flush and mm -hmm. only one of them held so again the pitfalls of embryo transfer happens to me as well and I'm very was very excited by this coat and it's been bought by our top producer so again mm -hmm. exciting to see how he will go on and progress mm -hmm. um, the video is a little bit on the shaky side here just to acknowledge that but um, I think you get a, a fair idea of the fold from it um, and obviously this isn't the mother that's with it that's a reset Mary yeah Angela yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Okay, so we'll move on. Um, you have covered the mare with um, Pegas van Rydershof, another yeah. pronunciation. Yes. And again, this is a stallion that people can look 
but you know um he certainly has has come into the to, to the world of repro um shouting his name um and what was your what was your reason for choosing him um well we felt that the Camille Faux cross worked very well with the mirror we were really really mm-hmm. pleased with the Camille Faux that she produced and um we also like emerald as i said before and i also very much rate Kirtani and you're doubling up on the Cathargo there mm-hmm. so um, yeah I just was f- very interested in him I liked him mm-hmm. I thought he complimented the mirror and he looked a very exciting young horse mm-hmm. and it's always good to use a good young sire so yeah mm-hmm. very very interesting horse yeah and he certainly has a has a, a wealthy damn line with him yeah it's phenomenal yeah it's fairly phenomenal yeah so um, just remind people they can submit their, their questions um, I cannot do the moment until I come out of the screen share but I will look at them when I when I get to that point so just to, to say to people I know there's a few hands raised there I will come back to that this lady here now is 12 years of age Miss Independence BC and um, jumped to meter 40 herself unfortunately I can't share this this particular video but um, yeah again it's something that that people can can look up can you talk to us about this Mary John can you still hear me Yes, yes. Um, we bought this mirror at the tail end of last year. Um, and this mirror, again, is one of the mirrors which kind of came in as a project. She's only got one ovary. And I think the previous owner had a couple of failed attempts at trying to get her uh, pregnant and stay in full. And touch wood, she is now um, about five months in full and all's going well so far. Um, she's a very interesting mirror. She's by Toulon, a sire which I really, really like. And again, very strong um, dam line. Jumped to 140 herself and was a very decent mirror. And as you see here, is a half sister to a 160 and a 145. Mm-hmm. Um, and again, like we said earlier on, we have the, the mm-hmm. performance through each dam line, or, which is important each each mother yes. has a produced performance. Yeah. So she she is currently in Fold Tirado. Yeah, yeah. So being a Toulon, she was a little bit um, strong in her type. And um, we thought that every day rather that we had seen um, at home and abroad always seemed to have real quality, good heads and really, really nice sorts. And we felt that he would cross well with the mare. So please God, she stays in full and it remains to be seen whether it's worked or not. But we certainly like the Diorados. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So this is the final lady because I do want to permit enough time that we have the op- opportunity to discuss the repro side of the, the house as well too. Yeah. Um, clever lady, a uh, 17-year-old mayor, um, competed with no less than Pius Schweizer himself. Uh, yes. And had been started off, I think, with, um, with Trevor Coyle. Am I right? Yes, I think that's right. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. Yeah, so she's seen a few pilots along the way, but... Um, you know, this mare impressed you? Yeah, so this mare obviously is by Cassini, which obviously is a very good, well-respected brood mare sire. And mm. accompanied with that, she has competed to 160 level. And mm. I think that obviously is the the holy grail as us to breeders, mares that are, you know, good solid yeah. pedigree and have good performance. Um, and this mare I acquired with Alan, as I said earlier, um, mm. on a, a trip to Lanarkin, maybe a drink too many, but yet it's still... <laughs> It ended up okay. We woke up never, in the morning. Never tell those stories. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't regret it in the morning, put it like that. Um, and uh, she has been with us for two years. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, she's been quite difficult to breed. We've mm-hmm. um, come under a number of pitfalls. <laughs> and I've mm-hmm. uh, uh, sort of bent the ear of a number of uh, experts. And mm-hmm. um, we have had no joy. And um, mm-hmm. so she, the plan is to send her for ICSI over mm-hmm. this coming winter, which is mm-hmm. the invaluable tool for a mare like herself, which we feel has, um, you know, a, a real would be a real asset to a breeding program. But unfortunately, mm-hmm. we're only able to breed her the conventional way. So ICSI is our mm-hmm. only option. So it's exciting to do that. Yeah. And yeah, Cornel Obolensky would be our first choice. Yeah, and and he himself also not always. A simple choice yeah. as well so again you know you're using that, that methodology to assist in that regard and i think it's important with the xc that you know um we're using a sire which is difficult to get in the conventional sense and you know mm-hmm. exploiting the xc till its maximum you know it's okay to use it you know just to use a sire that's fine 
but mm -hmm. um, we're, we're trying to, you know, come on on these horses, which are difficult. I think it's a mm -hmm. fabulous tool to use these sires with, yeah. I had intended to look at embryo transfer first, but maybe we'll, maybe we'll do it here. And just if you could just actually just explain for people who, who may not be familiar with the terminology of ICSI and what ICSI actually is, you know, maybe just in brief, if you could, could just, just put, that, put that, that in simple terms as to, you know, the difference between ICSI and ET. Okay, so ICSI actually is where you go and you take, uh, for want of a better expression, the eggs off the mirror or ova. Yeah. And you, um, they all go off to Aventine, Italy or Ghent. And the eggs are actually individually fertilized with semen from the stallion and then growing in basically like a in vitro situation. And then the embryo is growing today six or seven and then it's frozen. And you can actually then defrost that embryo and place it in a recipient mirror so just like embryo transfer but where it differs is that a mirror will have a number of um eggs on each mm -hmm. ovary and it's able to you know get multiple multiple mm -hmm. fertilizations from one lift and mm -hmm. it all happens outside the mirror whereas mm -hmm. embryo transfer the mirror goes in full as normal and it's mm -hmm. flushed seven to eight days after the ai process mm -hmm. and does that then effectively mean that you can be you know, more efficient also with the use of the recipients as well. Well, most definitely because, you know, you're working with frozen embryos. So then if it, when you're doing embryo transfer, you're at the mercy of what your recipient does mm -hmm. and they don't all obey the rules. And that's why we yeah. suggest to have two or three in an mm -hmm. ideal world. But um, when you're doing the ICSI procedure, they're frozen and obviously in liquid nitrogen, they are they're, they're frozen indefinitely. So if your recip doesn't work out, you don't have to defrost the embryo or thaw the embryo. You can mm -hmm. wait until um, your recipient is, is, is perfect and then mm -hmm. go ahead and do that procedure. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Now we'll just come back to this lady just for a second. Um, uh, you you also intend to use or hope to use um, for pleasure with her as well. That's the plan. Yeah, yeah, that's the yeah. plan. Um, all this remains, you know, hopefully it'll all go well. And mm -hmm. as like not every mirror with XE, you get a good lift. You know, there's all sorts of pitfalls, just like embryo transfer and conventional breeding. But if all goes well, that would be the two sires we would hope to use. Mm -hmm. with her and again that's something which we have considered uh, both Alan and I have both considered would mm -hmm. be a good cross for her and we've, we've sat down and talked about it and mm -hmm. um, I think most people will appreciate that the Cornet Obolensky Cassini cross really seems to work and mm -hmm. um, we really like for pleasure as a sire. Mm -hmm. Okay so I think what I'm going to do at this point is I'm actually going to come out of this um, so that I can see what questions are there Fanny and um, some people had raised and if those individuals who had raised a hand want to submit a question, they're very welcome to do so. Um, uh, uh, the, a query that is in here at the moment, have you ever kept a mare in foal? And if you do, is um, kept a mare in foal? And if you do, is there a specific things you look for to keep the mare in foal with twins? Um, I would never, I would, I would, sorry, I would never keep a mare in foal with twins. Um, basically because I have seen um, the bad side, the dark side of this mm -hmm. and um, if twins, um, and unfortunately even with experienced reproductive vets, mm -hmm. twins can be missed, they can be on top of each other. Um, I actually had an interesting case a year ago where I implanted a single embryo and the mare developed, she went home 14 days in full and um, when the other vet went to check heartbeat, he checked it and everything was grand and reported back to me everything was grand. But there is a phenomenon where a mare can develop what we call a zygomotic twin. And it happens somewhere past day 16 and it actually developed into two embryos. Mm -hmm. And obviously the mare aborted shortly after Christmas. And that's mm -hmm. a rare, complicated thing, which is mm -hmm. unavoidable for anyone. But mm -hmm. where twins are, a, you know, detected, I would be a big fan of obviously trying to manipulate and squeeze one. Mm -hmm. And if that is not possible, then I would be a fan of causing an abortion to the whole thing yeah. because I just feel that um, it's a disaster. Yeah, yeah, you know? it has the potential to be, yeah. It has the potential to be a real disaster. And I feel that it's so hard on the mirror and um, they're unavoidable that somewhere, somewhere the twins can be missed and it happens all the time. Mm -hmm. And yeah, try your best to get rid, but I would not be a fan of keeping them in. And it also, I suppose, stresses the importance of um, of scanning 
after covering and after after mating. Yeah, so so important, and, uh, yes. and and I would sort of really encourage people to scan fourteen days because mm-hmm. it's much easier to manipulate mm-hmm. and to get get a hold of a twin at fourteen days. Mm-hmm. I've done ones later on, and some work, some don't. But you're less yeah. than your chances every time the percentages go down. Yeah. Um, I suppose, you know, maybe just to start this discussion on the side of things, you know, gender transfer, it isn't for every mare. Um, and I, I suppose I suggest that donor mares really need to bring their A game to the table when you're considering it. Um, you know, because obviously, you know, it's, it's, it's a delicate job of work and um, there are expenditures involved in it. Um, do you, as a benefactor of the service delivery, do you agree with that statement? I do, yeah. I think that sometimes people get sort of a bit well-led about how to use embryo transfer to its maximum. And a mare still has to conceive to be a candidate for embryo transfer. And sometimes people think if a mare is difficult, you know, she is a candidate for embryo transfer. But mm-hmm. in fact, she might not be because, you know, she still has to conceive and go and fold. I think it's a valuable tool when you have a mare of high genetic value and a mare that you really want to sort of maybe produce one or two or three foals a year or a mare that perhaps is going in foal and then by the heartbeat scan is losing it well those mares are really good candidates because they are actually going in foal which is something Mm -hmm. we need to to occur for to be able to harvest an embryo. You know, obviously, I mean, com- mares that you want to keep in competition, that's, you know... that Big thing, sorry, yeah, I never mentioned big that. Thing. Big, big thing, mares yeah. that you want to keep in competition, yeah. And a question that, that does come in, and has come in, you know, is the process of embryo transfer with such mares that, that you want to keep competing, has it any negative impact on the mare or shown to have any ne- negative impact in the mare while she's in work or in competition? It's a very good question and it's a question which uh, isn't very easy to answer mm-hmm. and I think um, you know I'm not trying to sort of mm-hmm. give you a, a silly answer but basically mm-hmm. it's really case dependent some mm-hmm. mares and some horses are very cope very well with it and mm-hmm. you know it doesn't stress them out and there's absolutely no issue but yeah there are mares that sort of don't cope well with the mm-hmm. with the change in their uh, working pattern and also the disruption with embryo transfer. So it's very much case to case and depending on an individual. Mm -hmm. I'd say if a mare becomes highly stressed with traveling and with being manipulated, then, you know, that's a mare that you have to take careful consideration before you go, go down that route. Yeah. And for sure, you know, I mean, a lot of mares, even the group of mares that we've talked about here this evening, for the most part, they're older mares, they're in their teens and, 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 you know, some in, in, into that later stage of teens and 20s. And, um, you know, is it advisable if you have a, a, a donor mare that is a younger mare that, um, you know, that, that you're using for embryo transfer, is it advisable if she is able to, to have such a mare actually physically carry a foal herself from time to time as well? Or is that of any importance at all in the equation? I think it is. I think, you know, um, one of the pitfalls of these older competition mares, a lot of the time, um, it, you know, like when a mare becomes sort of 10 plus in reproductive terms, she's considered an older mare. And a lot of the problems with getting those mares in foal arrive due to her cervix being quite tight and the pooling of fluid. And um, the actual process of having the foal allows the cervix to be open and um, you don't fall into those pitfalls later on in life. So I think if Mm -hmm. it's possible, it certainly is, uh, will make the mare easier to breed in her latter years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then I I suppose as well, you know, the recipient is the other major part of the the conversation and, you know, um, good quality recipient mares, the right kind of recipient mares are are a big help in managing the costs and ensuring a good outcome at the at the other side of the equation as well. Maybe if you just talk to us a little bit about that. Um. I think uh, that's paramount and I think that um, mm-hmm. one of the problems that we fall into is that you know people you know consider a recipient mare to be the last thing they think about when going down this process but when in actual fact she should be one of the first things we think mm-hmm. about because ultimately she is holding your investment mm-hmm. and ultimately she is the the goose that lays the golden egg yeah. so yeah. i think it's very important that we select a strong healthy mare with no sort of history of reproductive problems mm-hmm. and i say that and you might think oh that's of course we've known that that but you'd be shocked at the amount of people you know i remember putting a embryo in for a man one time and it was there at 16 days we were delighted mm-hmm. and it was gone by heartbeat and he said you know what she done that last year and put her in full 
it's okay. our trouble, you know. <laughs> yeah, you know, okay. so I think some things we say that is a given. And um, I think when you're going down the route, route of embryo transfer, you have to be very well informed. And it is a significant investment, you know, um, in, 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 in your marriage. So you have to really strongly select a good recipient and be wise about it before you go down that route. Mm-hmm. So what kind of age of mares would you suggest? Um, look, well, you know, in an ideal world, I like four and five year old maiden mares, but we don't live in an ideal world, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. So I would consider anything up to 12 years of age that mm-hmm. has good confirmation and mm-hmm. that was reproductively sound and um, obviously was swabbed clean and was cycling normally and had you know good CL on ovulation and whatnot but yeah first and foremost you want a maiden but that's not always possible and I suppose good perennial conversation yeah confirmation and confirmation is a big thing yeah yeah you know um, and mares that have a folded foot would you ever consider those as a I've had to, and um, yeah. actually Angela, that has the Camille Faux foal that we seen earlier on, is actually carrying a Diorado Embry for a client. So mm-hmm. I'm not afraid to use those. I know other vets stay away from them. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think, again, it's not always an ideal world, so we have mm-hmm. to work with what we've got sometimes. And yeah. I think if everyone's going in with their eyes opened, it's mm-hmm. okay. And mm-hmm. I have to say, touch wood, it, it mirrors mm-hmm. with both foots have actually worked out fine for me. Mm-hmm. And I don't really see that uh, a drastic mm-hmm. difference in the results to mm-hmm. mirrors without a foot. Mm-hmm. And the health of these mares, in a general sense, in their general well-being, obviously, is something that's very important as well. Very important that these mares are, you know, free from parasitic infection, they're well wormed, um, vaccinated, you know, flu intact, and that they're in good health and they look well and they're in good condition is obviously what, paramount importance. And what about um, reproductively transmitted diseases? Is that something that, that you... Um, not, 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 not hugely. Um, I, I'm not actually sure on the statistics of reproductively transmitted disease, but no, not, not like the third. But you know, it's not a natural covering, so the mm-hmm. chance of transmission is quite low. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so venereal diseases aren't really a concern. It's more a mm-hmm. uh, overt clinical disease, and um, obviously the state of the mare as well, just as physical sense. Mm-hmm. And anecdotally, at least, the affordability of embryo transfer has improved. Um, you know, it is, a, it is still complex and it is still a delicate procedure um, and not without its difficulties and complications. Uh, for the average punter who has made, a, you know, a very good effort to have the right kind of recipient set up and, you know, you're kind of starting on a reasonable footing, what should one expect on an average basis is the kind of start to finish cost Okay, well, transfer because yeah. it is something that raises its head. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a very good question, actually, because um, you know, I suppose how long is a piece of string? It's really, you know, because it all sorts of depends on the type of semen you're using, frozen, mm-hmm. fresh, recept set up. Are you hiring a recept from an external source, or are you bringing your own recept to the table? Um, but like you know, you want to be budgeting anything, you know, from a thousand to 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 two thousand pound for the actual procedure, and then recepts can range from anything from a thousand to two and a half thousand for. Are you talking euro. sterling? Or are you talking euro? Euro, euro, euro probably. Yeah, euro. euro. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, because it, it 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 is something that I think people need to be very um you know, astute to going into it. Because Massively, yeah. yeah. Because, that really... because you can, it, costs can run away with you, you know, and um, yeah. it's important to, I suppose, have a careful selection of your mirror and, and, and you know, not everyone's doing this for commercial viability, mm-hmm. um, but if you are doing it for commercial viability, have the awkward conversation at the start and really have all your ducks in a row so that mm-hmm. you're going into it with your eyes open mm-hmm. and you're, you're aware of the pitfalls and obviously the financial implications. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And can we maybe just talk a little bit, you know, about the actual procedure itself and the timelines that are involved in that and setting up the mares and the synchronization process and what's involved in that and um, just explain that to people a little bit, please. Okay, so basically your donor mare is um, scanned like normal for any AI procedure and if she's in heat then we will order the semen and obviously manipulate her cycle to drop the follicle and with frozen uh, semen I watch for ovulation and AI when the mare has ovulated 
Um, and then from ovulation for fresh semen, we flush at day seven. So mm-hmm. seven days later, after ovulation has been detected, we mm-hmm. flush the mirror with fresh semen and seven and a half days for a frozen semen. Mm-hmm. And the embryo is flushed um, from the mirror's uterus and we use an embryo safe filter. And once the flush is over and the mirror has been, we've recognized by ultrasound that the mirror is empty, all the fluid that we put in has come back out again. We repeat that procedure mm-hmm. and then we, um, go into the uh, lab with this small um, Mm -hmm. uh, filter filled with Mm -hmm. fluid and embryo safe and we look under the microscope to try and identify the presence of an embryo Mm -hmm. and once we hopefully harvest a good embryo we we grade it um, Mm and but we still implant low grade or high grade embryos that aren't as good Mm -hmm. and because obviously we've got an embryo there we give it a go Mm -hmm. and then the embryo is um, washed Mm-hmm. and manipulated and then put inside the recipient mirror. The recipient mirror ideally for me is three to four days ovulation after the donor. Mm-hmm. So whenever the donor is in heat, you're also scanning your two to three recipients in an ideal world mm-hmm. and you're looking at their cycles and you're selecting which ones we're going to work out and suit. Mm-hmm. And in an ideal world, you will have two that will hopefully ovulate three to four days after your donor. Mm -hmm. and um, when you get the embryo and you've it washed and sitting there ready to go in I always scan the recipients again Mm -hmm. see which is most um, suitable and you're basing that on the presence of a good CL which is what Mm -hmm. occurs after an egg ovulates Mm -hmm. and you're making sure that's that's good and strong because that will produce the hormone progesterone which is the hormone of pregnancy Mm -hmm. and you're looking for the absence of uterine edema which is undesirable and then on the basis of that, you select which recipient is best and mm-hmm. implant the embryo. Mm-hmm. And then um, about five or six days later, um, you can detect that mirror for pregnancy. Mm-hmm. And I always check it five or six days. You don't mm-hmm. always see it. Sometimes it can be small and delaying in mm-hmm. um, development. And then mm-hmm. we always check again at eight or nine days and then confirm the presence or absence of the embryo. Mm-hmm. And are there better success rates dependent on the type of semen that you're using in this regard? Um, yeah, obviously, good fresh semen is obviously more um, fertile than frozen, generally speaking. But um, nowadays, the, the, the quality of frozen semen has improved somewhat. Um, obviously, apart from a few sires which have you know bad semen, that's just it. Um, but yeah, the, the results don't vary hugely, to be honest with you. The, the, the frozen semen is pretty good. That's going about just now. Mm-hmm. And potentially, I suppose as well, you know, you may end up flushing more than one embryo. You 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 could have you could have a, a, a tri- twins. Yeah, yeah. Even and triplets. I've had tri- I've had triplets once, and again, that that is the the big advantage of having two or three mirrors running alongside your donor. The fact that you might flush twins. Mm-hmm. And the hormones that you use to synchronize these mares. Do they differ to um, hormones that, that would be in use uh, in you know regular repro work um, in terms of the no not at all I keep it very simple you yeah. know um, run a herd or get in contact with someone who has a herd and mm-hmm. I try to keep it as natural as possible and with the recipients mm-hmm. in an ideal world I don't like to manipulate it all I would like it to all run quite natural and mm-hmm. I use the teaser a lot. And mm-hmm. I think it's really important to uh, mm-hmm. tease your mares and um, make sure that they're overtly in semen, or mm-hmm. sorry, overtly in season. Because mm-hmm. I'm a big believer in like you know, they should tease every mm-hmm. dry mare. In my opinion, should tease, and if she doesn't, mm-hmm. there's usually a reason. So I like to see mares teasing. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And um, a question here: Which is the preferred method to use embryo transfer, ICSI, and why? Um. That's kind of a, a hard question to answer. I think mm-hmm. embryo transfer and ICSI are both important tools and mm-hmm. they each have an important role, but it's very case specific mm-hmm. again. I think mm-hmm. ICSI is certainly a very valuable tool for a mirror that has competed and has low fertility mm-hmm. or when you're wanting to use a stallion which is no longer alive and there's a limited supply of semen or has very poor fertile semen so that has its role mm-hmm. embryo transfer is a good tool for like you said earlier on mirrors mm-hmm. are in competition and you just want to take a fold out of it but you don't want to disturb mm-hmm. competition and mm-hmm. um, embryo transfer would probably be the preferred method or if you have a high genetic mirror that you want to produce maybe two to three folds off per year and um, 
Abu transfer would be the preferred method. XC is still in early days, I suppose. Um, we still have to, uh, you know, still learning a lot about um, if there's any risks to performance or developmental issues that go with it. And I, as, as much as I advocate embryo transfer in XC, I think that they are worrying as well. Yeah. I think because genetic diversity is something which I think is extremely important. And I think it's something which um, we need to be careful that um, from a commercial aspect, we don't flood the market. And also from a genetic aspect that we ensure genetic diversity because we don't want hundreds and hundreds of Chapel Blues running around, you know. Um, so I think it's important that we, we use the tools wisely and, yeah, I, 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 I think that's, you know, that's a very meritable point to make, John, and particularly in your shoes to make it as well, too. Um, I think there's, there's absolute credibility about that. A question here, do you see that, that an embryo taken in autumn or winter is resulting in less foals than a spring embryo? I would agree. I think embryos taken, whilst this time of year is a good time to get embryos, I feel it's a difficult time for recipients to hold them. I think mares are going through sort of a transitional period where they're beginning to stop cycling and stuff. So I do always find the tail end of the season difficult mm -hmm. for embryo hold rate. And yeah, I think spring is, is ultimately the best mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. And of course, you mentioned there earlier on, progesterone is the, the whole pregnancy. Yes. Do you, with, any, with mares, do you... Do you do you use Regimate? I do, yes, I use Regimate, yeah. Um, with the recipients, we're kind of moving towards using anything. If the mare has a good CL and everything looks good, we are, uh, like our European counterparts, um, tend to not use anything, just do the transfer and um, not use any endogenous or exogenous drugs, just mm -hmm. leave nature. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I suppose a, qu a question I have as well is, you know, what is the, are there differences then, you know, procedurally if the intention is to actually freeze the embryos as opposed to do a, a, a direct transfer? Well, so I don't actually offer the free, froze, free, uh, freezing procedure here. Mm -hmm. The results are difficult with the frozen mm -hmm. embryos and it's something I've sort of steered away. Mm -hmm. And I feel that very much so from hearing from my European counterparts and actually I'm involved in a worldwide reproductive vet group. The results are sort of discouraging and mm -hmm. um, the procedure is differently. It's not something I undertake, but you, mm -hmm. you, you, you flush the mirror earlier and um, so that the embryo is smaller and easier to manipulate because obviously there's various stages you need to go through mm -hmm. to freeze the embryo. Mm -hmm. And what would your advice be to people who are considering um, purchasing frozen embryos um, or purchasing embryos via, via auctions and so forth? Um, you know, that insurance. <laughs> yeah, it's not, with, insurance. Not, not without its risks, yeah? Yeah, no, definitely not without its risks. And I think there is really good insurance packages available now. And I think I wouldn't, wouldn't buy any embryo without insurance um, mm -hmm. because sometimes the results we're led to believe are mm -hmm. not always the results people are seeing in, in, in practice. Mm -hmm. So it's important mm -hmm. to guard yourself as much as possible. Mm -hmm. This whole game is a gamble, but yeah. take educated risks. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Um, another question that's in here, um, do you, do you um, test your pregnancy if they are carriers for any genetic diseases? Um, no, I don't. Um, I know that one of the, the most important ones at the moment or one that is very much prominent is WFFS syndrome. Mm -hmm. And I know that all the kits that are going out for foals now are accompanied with it. Um, I haven't tested my marriage, but it's something I am going to consider doing and hopefully will do at the start of the year. Um, mm -hmm. Again, I'm not really aware that I've seen WFFS in, in practice in all the years I've been at this, but nonetheless, it's been demonstrated that it does exist. So I think it's important to mm -hmm. take as many precautions as you can. And it's really aside from that, I sort of don't really know of any other genetic disease, excuse my ignorance, that I would sort of be testing for. Unlike the Connemaras with the hoof wall, I don't really know um, any more diseases which were, we would be looking yeah, for. No. Nor, nor I at this point. Um, another comment here, um, we find sourcing a good broodmare with performance and pedigree a difficult task. Um, where would you suggest we start? Phone me. <laughs> <laughs> That's a very honest <laughs> question, um, I think I think that, um, you know, what has, been that... Your, what has been your route to success, I think maybe has been, is kind of like how, uh, how have you, how have you, um, you know, created the the um, the routes to 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 procuring mares. 
I think ultimately, you know, obviously I've been in this game a number of years and you make connections and you meet people along the way. And I think um, it's not easy to acquire a good broodmare. And I think, you know, you have to watch and advertise and, and, you know, first and foremost, you sometimes when you see these mares advertised in Europe, you wonder, well, the first question you ask Sheffield is, well, why are they selling them? And that is definitely a very valid question, because if a mare is sort of over nine or 10, you do ask the question that like, was her progeny not good enough? Because why are they now deciding to sell? And there's no easy answer to that question, I think is the day you buy is the day you sell. And I think you should put everything into buying as good a brood mare as you can afford. And, um, you know, I, I would I would sort of put more emphasis on buying the brood mare than the semen. You know, buy the best mare you can buy. That's ultimately all I can say on that. And yeah, it's not easy. You know, there's a number number of websites we use and stuff, but mm-hmm. it's not easy finding them. No, definitely not. But but I think um, you know, listening to you, I think you not only are immersed in in you know in your breeding activity and in knowing the stallions that are using and thinking around that whole process but i think you're also if i'm reading between the lines correctly you're also interested in the sport and you are you know you have an interest in 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 al- aligning yourself with the sport as well you know and very much so uh, you know i read I, I, that I like- correctly yeah, definitely. Like, you know what I mean? At the end of the day, there's no point re- breeding horses that riders don't want to ride. So I think it's important to, you know, go to shows, watch horses, talk to riders as much as you possibly can, listen to what they have to say, because they have the sort of advantage um, of riding all these different horses that are bred in different ways and sort of can tell you the pitfalls that those horses will come under that maybe stop them being a top athlete. So, yeah, I think listening in all aspects, anything you go to do and um, mm-hmm. listen you're doing your final goal with breeding any horse mm-hmm. is, is very important and we are going to have to wrap up now shortly but i want to ask you as well um john you know obviously at this stage in the year most breeders are you know they're they're, they're started or thinking about weaning and they're they're selling you know foals from this year those that are doing that um but there is also a cohort of breeders sitting there at the moment and scratching their heads maybe um because they're left with a, an empty mare at this point in the season and you know things haven't gone straight forward um and there are multiple 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 reasons why mares may remain empty at this point in the year but in the general sense you know what would be your top tips we'll say for managing those kind of mares at this point in the season um you know in preparation for a productive start into 2021? I think that's a very valid uh, question because ultimately like everything we have merged that have went home from here as well not in full and it's just some one of these things that happens mm-hmm. and I think if you can identify the reason as to why the mare didn't go in full and mm-hmm. um, it's important to act on that so there's all sorts of things that can be going on mm-hmm. whether it is um, an infection going on in the uterus there's a hormone imbalance or some mares don't breed with a full at foot and I think it's important to work along with your vet who has been doing the work to try and establish, is there a reason for the mare not going in full? And if there is, can you take action now to ensure this is the problem or is, is sorted? So in the case of dirty mares or mares that have a biofilm or mares that have a bad endometrial biopsy, is there anything you can do as to uh, increase that mare's chances? Do it now so that you can get the ball rolling early with lights mm-hmm. and with rugging them up and equiloom or whatever lighting mm-hmm. you want to use um, to in- get the mare started next season mm-hmm. as early as possible. But you can sort out the infection or any uh, confirmational issues or anything else. Do it, mm-hmm. do it now. Mm-hmm. And the the clock has chased me constantly, and I am going to call this now in two minutes. But um, just in the sense of, of, I suppose you know there was a, there was a question there, and it was asking about you know kind of um, testing performance testing your young stock, and you know the, the, um, also I suppose aligned with that the the um, looking at the the oh can I speak looking at the soundness aspect and x-rays of young stock as well too how important is that for you in your program it's if crucially you important up, but obviously with our program you're being, selling as foals, yeah, selling as foals yeah. but we are aware usually 90 percent of the time of the mirrors x-rays um, mm-hmm. and a lot of the mirrors you have have a strong performance background so yeah. certainly they have competed so usually the soundness issues um mm-hmm that the mirrors retire from we are mm-hmm. we sort of are 
we sort of guard that they're not something which would be genetically passed on. Mm -hmm. They are just injuries to the sport. Um, and so, yeah, we, as well as possible, we try to protect ourselves from that because ultimately they need mm -hmm. to have clean x-rays or as clean x-rays we can live with yeah. to go on and compete in the sport. Yeah. And it's worth mentioning that there are a number of schemes there at the moment that have been announced by horse. Yeah, it's very interesting. Yeah, very good. I look them up on, on the website there as well. So I am afraid I have this talk in front of me and it keeps moving around and it, it is suggesting that um, I, I call this now. Um, there's so much more we could talk about and 2021, you'll come back and join me again and take some <laughs> points and maybe look at the other half of your mare herd. Um, I sincerely thank you for your, your time you. in preparing for this evening. Um, I know you're available um, for inquiries and you have other mayors in your programme as well. Yes, yes. You, you are, are um, you know, there as somebody that is, is willing to advise others as well. Um, and I suppose from just Let's Talk Equine, our next webinar takes place on... Uh, First Tuesday in November, and I am going to be joined by um, Dr. Ursula Fogarty of the Irish Equine Centre and from the University College Dublin. And we will be looking at um, the issues around parasitism and some practical tips for for engaging with herd health on that um, on that that topic, because it's not also as I'm sure you you'll agree, John, without its complexities and misunderstandings. Things, um, yes, at so. level as well. So um, they're both experts in that topic and uh, I look forward to discussing with you. Our viewers will join us again for that. So for now, it, it is over to me to say good night to you and good night to our viewers and for your time and uh, I look forward to, to doing so in the future. Uh, John. Thank you, Andy. Thank you. Is there any parting comment that you would like to make as a kind of a, 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 a final piece of advice to, to people out there. Oh God, Wendy, you've caught me on the hop here now. <laughs> um, don't be afraid to pick up the phone to anyone and ask for advice and to listen. And I think, you know, it's important for our fellow breeders as well as vets to be open to talk and chat and all learn from our experience. Ultimately with myself, you know, I'm, I'm always willing to chat and chat over things, whether or not I'm doing business for people or not, I'm, I'm happy to talk to people about pitfalls and experiences. So mm -hmm. never be afraid to talk is the, mm -hmm. is the take home message. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it has been good to talk and I thank you for that. And uh, I bid you good night. Thank you, Andy. Cheers. Okay. Bye -bye. Take care. Bye-bye.